Good afternoon. Welcome to worship. It's great to have you all here this afternoon. And a special welcome to all those who are worshiping with us online and all those guests and visitors that are with us. If you're interested in learning more about what we believe and teach here at St. John's, you can talk to myself or Pastor Miller after the service. We also are having a Bible information class on this coming Wednesday starting at 630 we're going to start with some announcements. Uh, one announcement, somebody lost a phone, and if you're um, trying to find it, it's going to be up here on the altar then. And also, after the service, since we're going to be ending the service in silence, I just wanted a reminder to everyone that there is a book fair, the Northwestern Publishing House book fair that is open, and you can make your way down to the council chambers after the service if you so wish. We begin with the invocation. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. You may be seated. We continue with the opening hymn, With All My Heart I Praise You, Lord. Please note that this is actually a hymn that's going to be in the new hymnal that is coming out. And we will sing all the verses in unison.
Our scripture reading for today comes from Exodus chapter 12. The Lord told Moses and Aaron this in the land of Egypt. This month is to be the beginning of your calendar. It is to be the first month of the year for you. Tell the entire Israelite community that on the 10th day of this month, they are to take a lamb or a young goat for themselves, according to their father's households, one lamb per household. But if the household is too small for a whole lamb, then the person and his neighbor next door to him must select one based on the number of people. Determine what size lamb is needed according to how much each person will eat. Your lamb must be unblemished, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the Israelite community is to slaughter the lambs at sunset. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the house where they are eating the lamb. The night they shall eat the lamb, the meat, and has been roasted over a fire, along with unleavened bread. They shall eat it with bitter herbs. Do not eat it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over a fire, with its head, its legs, and its internal organs. You shall not leave any of it until morning. Whatever remains until morning you shall burn in the fire. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, ready for travel, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For on that night I will pass through the land of Egypt. I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both, both people and animals. Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you in the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. There will be no plague among you to destroy you when I strike down the land of Egypt. This day shall be a memorial for you, and you are to celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you must celebrate it as a permanent regulation. This is the word of the Lord. We continue with the sermon hymn, hymn 490, Love in Christ is Strong and Living. Jesus, who is the perfect servant, motivate us by his humility today to love each other like he loves us. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, a couple comes into a restaurant, a high-end restaurant, and they take a seat, led to a table, and they sit there and they wait. And they wait. Five minutes turns into 10 minutes, 10 minutes turns into 20 minutes, 
They're still waiting. They're upset with the servants. The server comes by and the husband grabs the servant and says, we haven't been waited on yet. It's our anniversary. Can't you wait on us? And the server says, "Uh, one moment, I have another table to take care of. By this time, the couple is fuming, so upset by the service that they leave. So has that ever happened to you? I'm sure that it has in one way or another. Maybe the cable person is coming over to serve by setting up the cable and they give you a time and the person doesn't show up. Maybe you're at a store, a retail store, and you're looking for help and you go and you find somebody, but the person doesn't give you the time of day and off they go to do something that they had in mind to do and and you're just upset by this service. What is going on with this service? So as we think of the world and how we live in this world, we see that it is based on a lot of service that goes on. You have skills and you have talents and in your job or elsewhere, you actually serve other people, don't you? And you get paid for that service. And really, we're talking about service that goes on. If you don't have those skills, then you look for somebody in that area. Like if you're looking for your taxes to be done, you look for a tax service. If your car breaks down, you look for an auto mechanic, an auto service center, where you can get that fixed. And so there's a lot of service that goes on. And when there's good service, what do you do? You say, great job. You may even give a big tip. This is great service. On the internet, you might find that company and you might click like and you might give a response, a positive response. This provided, this company provided good service, excellent service. Well, I have for you, dear friends, the perfect servant, the one who gives the perfect service above anyone else. And he gives you all the time, all of his time. And it's free. His service is completely free. And he gives you that service without looking down on you or demeaning you in any way. He provides the perfect service service. And of course, I'm talking about the Lord Jesus. And we study his service under the theme, hands of humility. That's really what's going on in our text. And so let me read this text to you. It comes from uh, God's Word, and I'm going to read from John chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved those who were his own in the world, he loved them to the end. By the time the supper took place, the devil had already put the idea into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. He got up from the supper and laid aside his outer garment. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. After Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer garment, he reclined at the table again. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord. You are right, because I am. Now if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Yes, I have given you an example so that you also would do just as I have done for you. Amen, amen. I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. This is God's holy word. Now this is all talking about what took place on 
the Thursday before Jesus died on the cross, the Thursday before that Friday. And you know that much was going on on that particular day. Jesus wanted to enjoy the Passover with his disciples. That's what we heard about in our first reading today. And that that Passover pointed to Jesus Christ coming, the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And then in that upper room, Jesus enjoyed the Passover with his disciples, instituted the Lord's Supper. We're talking about Holy or Maundy Thursday. And then he went out to the Garden of Gethsemane, and you remember how he prayed there, how Judas betrayed him, and he was taken. Well, let's go back to the upper room. And let's think about Jesus and how he knows all things. He is God. He knows what's coming. He knows the suffering that he is going to endure. It says in our text, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. So he knew what was coming in the next hours. And he knew ahead of time that Judas would betray him. And he knew what he was going to go through. As God, he's omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, and so he's aware of what's coming. But does he use those attributes that are his as God to make some kind of dazzling display? No, instead, he practices abject humility. He's a servant, and he shows how he is a servant and how he came to serve and not to be served. Well, Jesus foresaw the cross and how he would willingly go there. What, what, what are the disciples doing in that upper room? They're arguing. You would think that they would be thinking about what Jesus said to them, how he would go and he would suffer and die. But they're arguing about who is the greatest among us. That's what they're quibbling about. And then their argument goes further into this upper room as they realize that nobody is washing feet. You see, as they walked on those dirty roads with mud and other stuff on the roads, they had sandals and their feet became very dirty. And so it was the custom that when they went into a house, or in this case the upper room, their feet would be washed by somebody. It was a job that even the lowest of servants didn't want. Who's going to wash our feet? Who's going to wash our feet? Isn't somebody going to step up and wash our feet? Is what they're thinking. Isn't somebody at least going to step up and wash Jesus' feet? And nobody reached. Nobody reached for the bucket to wash the feet. So this happened to Jesus quite often in his ministry where people reacted in not a good way. You think about how he served over 5,000 people with a meal, with just a few loaves of fish, and, or a few loaves of bread and some, a few fish. A and how did they respond? Most of them did not believe Jesus to be the Lamb of God who had come to take away the sin of the world. And you think about the leaders of the Jews and how they wanted to trip him up and how they wanted to kill him. And then, then the disciples arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And Jesus had actually taken care of that argument before, and still they were at it. You might remember how James and John's mother went to Jesus and said, I want my boys to sit on your right and on your left in your kingdom. And Jesus responded by saying, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. So we wouldn't fault Jesus if he would just simply say, bad enough with these people. They just don't seem to listen. Forget it. I'm on my way. But that's not our Lord Jesus, no. What patience, what service, what hands of humility our Lord Jesus exercised here. On this Thursday before he died on the cross, 
he teaches a lesson, quite a lesson. And this time, he teaches it by example. It says, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped the towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around it. So he handled their pride with humility. He handled their arrogance with humble service and perfect patience. He, the God over all the universe, bent his knee and washed the feet. He's the one who took on the job of serving. And he did it because of love. He didn't give up. He went all the way, and he was going to go all the way to the very end. He loved them. And he wanted to teach them all the way through. It says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He wasn't going to quit. And he was teaching them how to serve. As he was teaching about his love and his service to them. Now think about our service to one another. Sadly, there are many times when we base our service on the behavior of somebody else. Think about that. If you have somebody who's obnoxious, who maybe just turns you off, you're just, ah, don't get along with this person, what do you do? You help that person? Are you there serving that person? Or, or you, do you ignore that person and maybe get as far away from that person as possible? Maybe in your family you have somebody who's a hothead, somebody who is obnoxious, somebody who is difficult. What do you do? Do you avoid them or do you serve them with your love? It's a good question. The irony of it is as we ignore them, as we push ourselves away from them, we're actually doing the same thing. We're actually being obnoxious in our way that we're treating them. But then we look at Jesus. And, and then we ask the question, what if Jesus would have responded in that way? What if his service would only be based on the behavior of people? You, you know what would have happened in that upper room. If that would have been the case, there would have been no washing of the disciples' feet by Jesus, because we're sinful. How often do we go against God's will? How often do we go against his law? How often do we sin? All the time, sadly. And if based upon our behavior, we shouldn't get anything from God. We don't deserve any of it. Our sins would not be forgiven, but it's not based on our behavior that is Jesus' service, his hands of humility but simply based on his love, which is unconditional. It's unlimited. Oh, his love for us continues even when our love for him has its moments of weakness. God continues to love us. And so his love is what moved him to wrap that towel around his waist and wash their feet. He didn't walk away from them. He served them. It says in the scriptures, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So for the times when we have been obnoxious, for the times that we have been disobedient, when we have not lifted our hands of humility, Jesus did for us. He paid for every single time that we have sinned against his command here to love each other like he has loved us. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. What Jesus did here must have caused the disciples to feel ashamed and to feel guilt. Think about yourself there, what you would have felt like. Jesus, down on his knee, washing my feet. That was not the main objective of Jesus, to cause them to have shame and embarrassment. 
but rather it was to show them his love, to also motivate them with his love, which would be shown ultimately on the cross. That's the perfect service that Jesus gave to us as he took our place and died for all of our sins. He was a servant all the way to the cross. And he wanted them to recognize that, to trust that, and to, to respond to it with service to one another. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, he says, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. As Jesus was talking here, he didn't take his credentials. Of course, they're ultimate. He's true God, God above all. And he didn't wave them in their face. He rather continued his service to them, showing them his love and then motivating them to love each other. So the, the point here as we finish studying this section is not the outward act of washing feet. That's one way that you show service to one another and you use hands of humility. No, it's love. It's love for each other. We wash feet when we help one another. We wash feet when we're there to encourage each other. And so don't get stuck on the washing of feet, but rather on the love of God for you and his service toward you. He has done everything for you. He's the perfect servant. Remember how we talked about him before? What he does for you is free. We can't earn it. There's no way we could pay it up for it. All the silver and gold couldn't pay for this service. This is service from our Lord that is completely, totally free. And it's for all people. He doesn't pick and choose. He doesn't say, oh, I'll be nice to them like maybe some servers do. Oh, I'm going to get a good tip from them, so I'm really going to give them good service. But, oh, not those people. No, Jesus' service is for all of you and for all people. And so we want to respond with love toward one another, lifting hands of humility. And why? Why, because of Jesus and what he did. How oh, he lifted his hands finally perfect humility. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. It's at this time that we usually think about giving our offerings, and if you brought one, certainly you may give it by placing it into the slotted cabinets or the slotted box. Again, it's a way that we Show love with our hands of humility. Please be seated for our next hymn, which is hymn number 136. Twas on that dark, that doleful night.
You may remain seated for the Lenten meditation. During this Lenten season, we have followed the suffering of Jesus by the hands of sinners. By Jesus' willing and perfect hands, we have enjoyed his love and forgiveness. Our love, faith, and dedication have all been strengthened by God's grace as we seek daily to amend our sinful life. With the family of the church, God never wearies of giving peace and new life. In the absolution, we receive forgiveness as from God himself. This absolution we should not doubt, but firmly believe that thereby our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. For it comes to us in the name and by the command of our Lord, who we receive God's love and Jesus Christ are called to love one another, to be servants to one another as Jesus became our servant. In Holy Communion, the members of Christ's body participate most in intimately in his love. Remembering our Lord's Last Supper with his disciples, we eat the bread and drink the cup of this meal. Together, we receive the Lord's gift of his body and blood and participate in the new covenant that makes us one in him. The Lord's Supper is the promise of the great banquet we will share with all the faithful when our Lord returns, the culmination of our reconciliation with God and one another. Please stand for the confession of sins. Let us confess our sins to God and ask for his forgiveness. Almighty God, the merciful Father, I confess to you that I have not loved you with all my heart. I have pursued my ways instead of your ways, and what I have done and left undone. I have not loved my brothers and sisters as myself. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and now. Forgive us for the sake of Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for us. Cleanse me from my sins, release me from my guilt, grant me your Holy Spirit, and amend my sinful life. The Almighty God has been merciful to us and has sent his Son to die for all. For his sake, for he forgives for our, our, us our sins and calls us from darkness into his marvelous light. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lord, who has forgiven us and reconciled us to God through Christ our Lord, has also promised us the power to forgive and love one another. Therefore, let us be reconciled with one another and extend to another the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, I forgive you just as in Christ, God has forgiven me. And may the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, in our words, and in our actions. We pray. Lord Jesus Christ, in the sacrament of Holy Communion, you give us your true body and blood as a remembrance of your suffering and death on the cross. Grant us so firmly to believe your words and promise that we may always partake of the sacrament to our eternal good. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with hymn 309, Draw Near and Take the Body of the Lord.
please stand for prayer. Dear Father, as our Lord Jesus Christ gave thanks to you when he broke the bread, as he gave you thanks when he took the cup, Lord Jesus Christ, both our high priest and the offering for our souls, In our poverty of righteousness, we have nothing to offer but our gratitude for your perfect righteousness. But thanks be to you, for through your sacrament of the New Testament, O Holy Spirit, dwell within us as we remember in this sacrament our Lord's death. Help us to live, to live our lives as sacrifices of thanksgiving to him who first loved us. You may be seated. To continue with the next hymn, O Christ, Lamb of God, we will sing this in unison. Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper and members and those united with us in faith and doctrine come to Holy Communion, both sides will approach up the middle aisle at the same time, but staggered with the appropriate, appropriate distancing from the person ahead of you. Appro approach continuous communion individually or as a household. For unique cases, gluten-free wafers and non-alcoholic wine are available in glass dishes. Return to your pew by the side aisle, placing your cup in the receptacle. There is no need to rush as you stop at each table. We'd like to consider of what we are receiving today. The general blessing will be given at the close of Holy Communion. Please come for, now, for all things are now ready.
may this true body and blood strengthen and preserve you in the true faith for life everlasting. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. We remain seated for prayer and then silent meditation. After this, we will have the stripping of the altar. There will not be any stripping of the altar during this service. That will happen at the 7 o'clock service, but we will read through that section. Our Savior Jesus Christ, God provided us with a Passover lamb to save us. From eternal death when he sent you into the world and sacrificed you on the cross for our sins, a work true repentance in our hearts causing us to make sincere confession of our sins and to believe with joyful trust that he has forgiven us for your sake. May your body and blood given and shed for our sins and imparted to us here this evening in bread and wine and that supper, which comm commemorates your death, ever nourish our faith, cheer our hearts, and strengthen our will to live godly and upright lives. Precious Redeemer, May your face that once reflected the burden of our sins and the anguish of hell be ever turned towards us in love and tenderness. Let no one in this Christian assembly who has known you as a friend and Lord, as well as Savior, ever betray your love. And may the dear blood once shed for us be for our sins the perfect cleansing power. Hear us to the glory of your name, Holy Redeemer. Amen. After the Last Supper, less than 24 hours remained in the earthly life of our Lord. Events moved rapidly. Prayer in the garden, betrayal by Judas, arrest, mock trial, painful beatings, floggings, ridicule, condemnation, a march to Golgotha, and finally, execution. As he was stripped and freely gave up his life, so we strip our altar and chancel area of the signs of life to symbolize Christ's purposeful, redemptive suffering and death for us. We surround our altar with plants to symbolize new life springing forth. In the passion and suffering of Christ, his human life faded from him. In recognition of this, we remove these plants from our sight. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The events of Golgotha under Christ's willingness and love snuffed out Jesus, the light of the world. Human life. As the sky was darkened when he suffered, so we extinguish our candles and remove them from our sight. The missile stand holds the books that guide our worship life together as we hear God's word and respond with prayers and praises back to God. As Jesus suffers, these normally joyful sounds grow quiet. As these songs of joy are removed from our lips, so we remove the altar book and missile stand from our presence. Our altar, altar is in the form of a table. It is here that our Lord serves us his banquet feast. He offers us his word and sacrament. Paraments, the clothes that cover our altar and display symbols of our God and salvation. They are finely crafted and embroidered. Materials appropriate for feasting with our king. Purple, the color of Lent, also points to the purple robe Jesus wore as the soldiers mocked him, as our king's body was stripped of the purple robe, and also his dignity. So our altar, pulpit, and lectern are stripped of its coverings. Our chancel and altar are now empty and bare are ready for us to remember the stark reality of Christ's suffering for us on Good Friday. We will worship him in this setting tomorrow. We sing him 110 stanzas one and two, and then we leave quietly contemplating. Go in peace, amen.